Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so my name is Katie Green. I've been working at Iowa Workforce Development for 14 years, and the majority of that time has been spent working on the Labor Shed program. Uh, we like to give a little background. Not everyone's familiar with what's a labor shed. We like to think of a labor shed in the same terms of kind of like a watershed, where you're trying to, what are the sources of water for a lake or basin or whatever is training into in terms of a labor shed. We're using commuting patterns to determine what are the sources of labor for a particular community or employment center. And then we survey those sources and we collect workforce characteristic data that's reported in the labor shed study. A little background on the labor shed. It was developed in 1998 by the University of Northern Iowa's Institute of Decision Making in a similar economic climate where things were really tight, job market was really tight, and they're trying to find some sort of data source that could give an insight to where maybe there are potential pockets of labor that employers and communities can tap into to fill those spots. Um, in 2000, the legislature passed that the state would take it over, and my agency has been doing that ever since. And then two years ago, maybe it's, man, maybe it's even three or four by now, at least track of time, uh, it used to be a fee for service. And so any community that wanted a study done would pay a subsidized portion of it. M majority was still financed by the state, but the communities were asked to contribute. Um, and then, um, talking to the Iowa Economic Development Authority, who uses our data a lot, um, sometimes there'd be kind of data deserts because some communities weren't purchasing these. And they want to be able to ask us for current data anywhere in the state if they have a prospect looking to move in. So about four years ago, they partnered with my agency and now we fully finance one study in each county every other year. So we'll do like the northern half of the state in year one, southern half, in year two and the community that the study is done in within the county is always the county's largest employment center it's going to have the biggest commuting pattern to see where the draw is to get people to come into the county for work so how is a labor shed determined there's basically three major um, working cogs in a labor shed the first one is our employer survey so the first thing we do is we send a letter to every employer in Ames, in this case, that has five or more employees, and we ask them to tell us where those employees live. And we can see where people are living, and they're coming to Ames for it, because that's where the employer is located, and we can plot a commuting pattern. <clears throat> for Ames, 859 employers were contacted, 236 responded for participation of 27.5%, which is a little bit lower than what we aim for. We try to get about a third of employer participation in order to feel really confident about the results. However, the employers in Ames that did respond were many of your large employers. So this still represented 20,000 employees coming into Ames, and it was about 50% of your overall employed people in Ames were represented by that 27.5% of employers. So now we can plot our community pattern. We can see where people are coming <coughs> from that are working in Ames. And this is what it kind of looks like. So it's kind of hard to see the lighter gray, but Obviously, the core of your employees live and work in Ames. So they're just, there's 52%, just a little over half, live here and work here. And then your next largest contributors are Boone, Nevada, Story City, and Ankeny and Huxley. 48% <clears throat> of all of your employees live outside of Ames. Then you have your next largest contributors in this dark gray, and then you see how far out people will travel to Ames for work. <laughs> Now this is the raw data that employers provided us. You can see in this area shown map that I'm not actually showing you that people from all over the state are reported to come into Ames for employment. Although it might just be one here, one there, one there. Keeping in mind that map, one of the reasons why a labor shed study um, is unique is compared often to other readily available labor market information is that it's not restricted by political boundaries, county lines, state lines, whatever. Where So when you take into consideration all those communities that we have um, documented based on employer feedback, that they have employees coming from those communities, you can think of, if, if I could tap into each of those communities between the ages of 18 and 64 working age, and then taking into consideration labor force participation rate, 
you really have a potential labor shed area that has 566,000 potential employees, people that could come to my community because people are documented from traveling that far to work in my community. Whereas if you looked at other readily available labor market information, it's restricted by your county border, or you could do multiple county borders. But if you look at, for instance, the most um, recent data for Story County, you have, now this is just residents of Story County, 60,000 that are in the labor force. That doesn't mean they work in Ames, doesn't mean they work in Story County. And then if you look down here, this number represents the number that are employed within your county. Um, so that doesn't mean they live in Story County, they can be coming from outside. We have 46,000, and it's always specific to your county. So it could be Story City, it could be Jewel. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so that's one of the reasons why people like to use the labor shed. Um, numbers to leverage the potential labor that you could get to come in for instance if a new prospective business was determining whether there's enough available labor to fill their open positions. So the next part of the labor shed study is the uh, residential survey. So we've asked employers where did your employees live and we've plotted a commuting pattern. The next thing we've done is we've cleaned that up and we've narrowed it down to the communities that most highly contribute to Ames employment, their workforce. And then we survey those residents. And this is how we break down the survey. So we have 600 total surveys in our analysis. We collect 200 of those surveys from what we're calling zone one, and that's just the Ames zip codes. So if you live in a zip code within Ames, um, there was 200 people that contributed to these results. Then zone two, which is this kind of teal color, those are communities that are either within 20 miles of Ames, or we found that they contribute 3% or more to uh, Ames that in commute. And those 200 surveys for zone two are divided amongst those communities, and that's based on population. If Nevada has a higher population than Colo, Nevada got more of the 200 surveys than Colo did. And then the next zone, and you have a very large zone, uh, three, is zone three. And these are um, communities that are further than 20 miles from our node city, which is Ames, but they did have a significant number of in-commute documented to come into Ames for employment. So we've kind of cleaned up all the extraneous zips that covered the entire state and are like realistically where are the majority of your employees coming from. And this is your footprint. This is your labor shed area. <clears throat> so now that we have that zone, we do the household survey. We uh, It's conducted over the telephone, landlines, and cell phones. We also send out letters and encourage people to go online and take it. So it's a multimodal survey. Um, we ask a lot of questions. Um, these are just a small sampling. We ask them their employee, uh, employment status. We are interviewing residents between the ages of 18 and 64. That's our cutoff. You have to be within that range. And we, uh, it doesn't matter if you're currently employed or unemployed or homemaker or retiree. We'll still interview you to collect your information. And we ask information about what's your current or former occupation to your job title, uh, what industry, who's your employer, what kind of wages do you earn or formerly earned or desire to earn. Um, your education level, benefits, what sources do you look at when you're searching for a job? It's a 10 to 12 minute long survey depending on how you answer. If you say you're employed, you have a much longer survey than if you say I'm retired and I don't want to go back to work, then it's like, okay, thanks, and the survey's okay. <laughs> so, one of the unique variables that we do collect in the labor shed survey that can't really be found elsewhere is that we ask the question of, okay, you're employed. Are you likely to change your employment situation? Are you very likely or somewhat likely? And 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 that way, we're you're kind of like narrowing down a specific population of people that might not be satisfied. They might look like they're employed and they're not in the market, but they're in the market. Um, and then we also we ask that question of everybody. So whether you're a homemaker, are you likely to return to the to the workforce? Unemployed, retired, all of them get asked that question, and then that lengthens their survey if they answer yes to it. Yeah. I have a question about the home. How do you find those individuals to connect with? 
<clears throat> do you, like, I know you said like by population and how many surveys go to Nevada versus Colo, but then how do you dig into, I'm gonna call Joe Smith. Or so it's a random sample <laughs> that our vendor, our survey vendor is, collects uh, so many phone number contacts per zip code. We tell them we need 10 surveys and 50011, but it's probably been more than that, I'm sure. But, <laughs> and so then they have to go buy a list of phone numbers of people who live there they first verify that that person, if they answer the phone, so it takes a while for them to get a hold of somebody. First they verify, do you live in this zip code? And then they ask them their age and verify that they're within the sample that we want, but it's a random sample. So what is a good point. One of the main things we're trying to do is represent um, the population to kind of reflect what the census is saying. So we don't want to interview um, more men than women. We don't want to interview more 55 to 64 year olds and 18 to 24 year olds, unless the census says like, actually there's way more 18 to 24 year olds in this area. So you do need to try and bias it. It's difficult to do, but in general, it's a random sample. And then we will, when we're putting together our data set after we've collected all these surveys, we'll kind of clean it up a little bit. If we have, if you know, our data set is combined with when we first collect for AIMS, we have a whole bunch of surveys we've collected for other areas that might overlap aims. So we can like, if the survey said that we're given by our vendor is 60% men, we can take some from a prior survey that was not collected forever ago, but was collected for a different study and kind of like even it out. So we got 50-50 representation, um, but it's a random survey. Um, and if anybody has any questions, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Like I'm a one of seven kids in my family, so I'm really used to being interrupted and I can't complete thoughts, let alone sentences. So I'm not worried about it. Um, the third major functioning part of the survey is the statistical model. <clears throat> this was developed by the University of Northern Iowa and they still uh, maintain this for us and update it for us on an annual basis. <clears throat> The statistical survey, or statistical model, excuse me, uh, takes data that's been collected since we started. So like 20 years worth of data. And every year it chops off some years that are on the tail end. And it looks at certain variables and how they impact people's um, uh, willingness to travel. Uh, does your gender impact your willingness to travel? The statistics say, say that it does men are more likely to travel for work than women. Does um, your employment status, the wages you can earn in the city you're going to, these are all variables that have been identified to influence you. So these variables are put into a regression model and it's the third part of our, um, our labor shed study that kind of gives an estimate that of that geography that we've, I've said is your labor shed area, your footprint, what is the likeliness like I said, oh, 566,000 people are at your doorstep, right? But this model, we put all that information in the model with the influence of historical analysis and say, okay, but what's the likelihood? How many people from each of those are likely to come to Ames? And we'll see that of the 566,000 people at your doorstep, the model is saying about 82,000 of them are actually likely to come into Ames for employment. Yes. So does that number not include folks who already live in Ames? No, it includes names as well. Okay. So that's kind of the background on how I got to the findings that we're about to go over. So the results of your current study, um, this is, now we're just looking at those who identified themselves as employed. So the overall 600 survey data set that's 50-50 male, female, as close as we could get, when you look at just the employed, it comes out to a little bit higher male than female are employed. Your average age is 39. They primarily speak English. Um, you can see that 85 and a half percent of all of them re responded that they're employed. That's followed by 7% that said they were unemployed, 3.3% a homemaker or 4.2% retired. Now that 7% unemployed, you're like, whoa, that's not what the government's telling me, right? <laughs> because your recent unemployment rate out of the Bureau of Labor Statistics was about 1.8%. Now, the Bureau of Labor Statistics supplies a much, much stricter um, definition of unemployment. You have to be available for work. You have to be looking for work. 
you have to have shown you you're looking for work. Whereas our study is completely self-identified. How do you see yourself? Are you one of these four things? So the unemployed could include students. If they don't, are, if they're going to identify themselves as one of those four things, they might say they're a student or unemployed. Um, it could include people who are long-term unemployed, which the Bureau of Labor Statistics would not consider unemployed because they've been employed too long. Um, but the second question that we ask after this is what's your likeliness to change your employment situation or accept employment? And as you can see, 83.3% of those who said that they were unemployed are likely or very likely to accept an employment uh, opportunity. So if you take that number by our 7%, you get a little bit lower, it's about 5.8% now. Later on, you'll see we ask these, this group again, okay, you said you're likely to accept employment, or are you actively seeking it? Are you waiting for something to just fall in your lap, you know, basically? And about 54.3% say, no, I'm actively looking for work. So then that brings our number down a little bit closer to what the BLS is saying. So it's about 3.2%. So it's not apples to apples, but when you're just allowing people to identify themselves, how they see themselves without applying a definition, these are the results you get. One of the things I'll point out on this slide too is that you have 40% of homemakers and 40% of retired individuals saying that they are very likely or somewhat likely to accept an employment opportunity. Both of these numbers are above average, especially the retirees. And to keep in mind, we're only interviewing those between 18 and 64. So these would be people who are not 65 plus retirees. Can you share with us the period of time which these people were interviewed? So are we, are we talking through COVID period? We're we talking just in the last 12 to 18 months or? So right, I knew someone was gonna ask that question. <laughs> so right before I started, I asked my colleagues, can you look at the data set and tell me what the data collection dates were? They were from August 21 to July 22. Okay, thank you. I'll tell her thanks too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the education level this is another question we ask um, uh, in this area it's probably not a great surprise to you having a university you have third a third of your respondents said they have a bachelor's degree followed by 20 percent with a master's or doctorate that's over half of your population with um, postgraduate or um, yeah second post-secondary excuse me degree then you have um the some education beyond high school no degree that 15.8 percent i like to just explain that this means that the individual that we interviewed did something after they graduated high school <clears throat> it could be that they went through a four-year program and didn't do their last semester and so they're so close but don't have the degree or it could be somebody who attended some night classes at a community college and never earned a certificate through it or something. So it's a wide varying uh, category there. Um, but for less than high school and just a high school diploma, um, you have some of the lowest numbers in a labor shed area that, than most labor sheds across the state. So then we talk about well, who do you work for, right? And um, they, they give us their employer's name. They also tell us what industry their employers in. Lots of people don't actually know what industry their employers in, so we double check that um, and, and code that correctly. But the employed here, 17% are working in wholesale or retail trade, followed by 16% in education. Finance is the third highest, and then healthcare. This is an interesting labor shed area because manufacturing did not make the top four. Um, manufacturing is almost always in the top four, and it's in the top for the, for the state as well. And then we ask them, what's their job title, right? What, what do you actually do? Well, 40% said that they work in a professional, paraprofessional, or technical occupation. So this includes teachers, nurses, accountants, people in finance, people um, <clears throat> uh, doing uh, like IT work, things like that. Managerial, that's self-explanatory, is the next size, but it's you know, 20 points behind your 40% in the <laughs> professional area. Then that's followed by production, construction, manufacturing, operating, occupations, which are like your forklift drivers, your truck drivers, your construction workers. And then clerical is the, rounds out the top four at 10.4%. We ask um, our interviewees about their wages. 
in the Ames Labor Shed area, the median hourly wage is $18 an hour. That's across all industries and occupations. That's just the, uh, the median. 41.9% um, said they earn an hourly wage. Um, and then the top wages are in the construction industry at $23.50 uh, and the personal services at $22.50. The personal services one is really high. I never see it that high. I don't know if you guys have an explanation because you're more familiar with the area of what um, areas might be employing that occupational title or that or what industry, I'm sorry, which, which employers would fit in that industry. But that's really high for a uh, personal services industry. Um, but then finance at 21, that's more in line with what we see, manufacturing at 20 and public admin and government at 19. Um, and then, then we ask, you know, first we ask, what kind, what's your compensation type? <laughs> Hourly, annual salary, um, commission, combination, some other. So we don't do any calculation on our end to, you know, if they gave us an hourly wage and make an assumption, okay, so they work full-time hours, so this would be their annual salary, we don't do that. We just ask them what's your if you're hourly or salary, um, yeah, salary, and then depending on what they say, then they're asked, okay, what's your hourly wage or your annual income? So there is no, yeah, uh, this is just straight numbers that we were given through the interview. So 50 and a half, 50 and a half percent said they were salaried, and the median overall was 75 grand. The highest being earned in the public admin and government industry at almost 100 grand, and then finance at 84 thousand. You might notice that the 50 and a half percent and the 40, whatever it was, 41.9% don't add up to 100. That's because we do um, accept other offers that they're paid in an alternative way, whether it's commission or um, by the mile or by the, um, the job or things like that. So they're excluded from these two slides analysis. And then at an occupational level, you can see what um, uh, wages people are earning. Uh, with the professional, paraprofessional, technical occupational category at the highest, at a median of $22 an hour, or the salary level is at in the managerial category at $82,500. <clears throat> we often don't get information from farmers, so this isn't unusual to see the uh, asterisks out on the ag. Um, and these are the top benefits that were reported for those who are full-time employed with vacation, um, topping out the list at 94.9% having a vacation, followed by medical, dental at 89.7, and then the last one's holidays, 71.9%. So that's the first group of people we're gonna look at. The second group is those who said they were employed, but also said, I'm likely to change employment. That was 31.6% of those who reported themselves as employed. And according to the model of that 82,000 that are likely to actually come to Ames from employment, 71,000 are currently employed and likely to change employment if the opportunity presented itself. Top reasons for wanting to change. They want better wages. 26.1% said that they would change their job if they had a higher wage. The next highest reason was career change, just looking for to go down a different path, 14.4%, followed by a fear of an employer layoff or closure, or they're aware that that's about to happen. And then personality conflicts at work and working conditions are the other driving factors for wanting to change their current situation. Of those who said they're employed, likely to change, again, it's slightly more um, heavy on the male side, 51.6% male to 48.4% female. The average age is a little younger. Um, the overall employed was 39, this is 36. And then if you can look at the age range in the pie chart above where, of the entire group of those who said they're employed, likely to change, the majority of them are between the ages of 25 and 44. But if you look within each category, instead of looking at them as a whole, if we just look at the 18 to 24 year olds, how many of them are likely to change? Almost half, which is not uncommon. They're much more kind of fluid in their employment situation. They're like, okay, I tried that, I didn't like that, let's try something else. Whereas the 55 to 64 year olds, 
This is also very common. They're like, I'm over here. I can see the pension on the horizon. I'm not going anywhere, right? <laughs> And then we kind of break this down by what their occupation is. 36.8% of the employed that are likely to change are currently working in a professional, paraprofessional, technical category. So again, that's your nurses and your teachers and your accountants and your IT people. The next highest is production. So as part of the whole, these are the most likely to want to change. When you look at them individually, salespeople, have almost half of them that are like, I would change my current position, and that's followed by clerical, which is a little unusual for clerical to be that high. Usually we'll see the top highest one being in sales and service. So what could be, you know, they already said wages are top reason why it would change. And then we can just look at this in the data and see that the result shows that of those who said that they're employed and unlikely to change, so they're presumably satisfied with their employment situation, they're earning a median of $20 an hour. And those who said they're likely to change are earning, are earning a median of $17.25. So you can see that that answer of looking for better wages does play out in the data that they are earning less than those who are satisfied. The same for those who are earning an annual salary. With those unlikely to change at 80 grand and those likely to change at 70. And then these are the top desired benefits. So you would look at this slide and, and think about what, if I was gonna make an employment offer to someone, what are they looking to see? And this reflects what the full-time employed are currently earning in that it's vacation number one, health medical number two, pension, 92.5% uh, at three. They're all really tight up there. I mean, they're all in the 90s. It's all obviously very important for these things to be offered to them. It is unusual in the last few years for health and medical to be superseded by anything because it's that's always been the number one for almost as long as I've been doing this. But recently vacation has taken the lead on that for whatever reason. So question on that, kind of going back a little bit. So when you were talking about healthcare, mm -hmm. were you able to differentiate between how much that each employee was given healthcare, whether it's full health, whether it's 50%? So. You, you mean like um, their share of the premium cost? Yeah. Okay, so I wish I had made a slide for this. We do ask that question. Do you pay all of it? Does your employer pay all of it or is it shared? I don't have the results right in front of me. I could text somebody and ask them for the results. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just hearing more and more of that from, yeah. from people that are saying that 100% healthcare is being covered. Uh -huh. So that would make sense to me, this right here, if that's right. more of what sure. you're getting. Yeah, and um, later when we get to the end of the presentation, I'm going to take you out to the web and show you the results online so you can see where to find them. And I'm pretty sure, and actually I 100% know that that is in there, and so we can look at it then. Just remind me. Um, but yeah, uh, and then we also do a, we're actually currently conducting uh, something called a workforce needs survey, and that's for employers. And we ask employers on their side of it a lot of benefit questions. What do they offer? Um, how much does it cost them per employee for whatever benefit package? Those results won't be um, available probably till next year, but um, they will be out on our website as well. Can I ask one yeah. more question kind of along the same line? So um, the breakout of employed by industry, the largest number were the wholesale, wholesale retail. Uh -huh. Do we know how many of those jobs have benefits? If those people have benefits? I can definitely get you that number. It's not in our overall uh, data release, but yeah, we would be able to look at everyone who said they were in that industry, of them who said that they have benefits. Or So the question is phrased to them, does your employer offer benefits? Not necessarily that they take advantage of them or not. And then um, after, if they say yes, and they say, then we ask, is it shared? Uh, do you pay it all? or does your employer cover it all? So we can break that out by you know any industry if you wanna just know what did the wholesale retail people say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious because they're, they're the ones that are the least. Right. And they're the largest percentage of our population. Yep. Or of our, Employed. of the sample. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, yeah, definitely would be interesting. Thanks. 
Yep. Um, and then another question we asked them is, how far do you drive for work? And we asked them to give that to us in miles and minutes because that changes, you know, depending on where you live, it doesn't translate a minute to a mile in lots of places. But uh, so uh, they're currently saying it's about 11 miles one way to work, or they spend about 16 minutes to get to work. But then we asked them, how far would you be willing to travel if you had an employment offer you were interested in? And they said almost basically double it they'd go 24 miles or spend about a half hour on the road to get to um, their job. Yeah. How about remote work? Did you, is there anything in this that you're going to be dealing with for remote work possibilities? So we just recently added a remote work um, question for the 2021 statewide collection. So some of this it's not reported here today. I won't be giving you those results. But we do ask them, um, what's your work environment? Meaning, do you work from home? Do you work at an employer site, a customer job site, or do you travel? And then the follow-up question to that is, what do you do the majority of the time? So we can get a breakout of, what it, do, are you allowed all four of these options? Or are they are not allowed, but do you, are you required to do these four things? And then what do you do the most often? So you can kind of get like 20% said, that they can work from home and all of them do that 100% of the time or whatever that breakout might be. I did do a statewide analysis of that, but I have not done that on any individual level. <clears throat> and then towards the end of the survey, we asked them, okay, you said you're likely to change. Are you actively looking for a new opportunity? About 30% of those who are currently employed said, yeah, I'm looking for a new opportunity. And they're looking for that on the internet on the sites indeed.com and LinkedIn were the most highly reported for a job search. Um, now, these results do vary based on the population of people you're analyzing. If you had me poll, what are construction workers who are looking to change work? Where do they look for work? I would guess it's not gonna be indeed.com as your number one answer. So it is important if you're trying to figure out, you know, where should I put my advertising dollars to kind of try and get that information to see where your interested population is looking. You might as well put that ad there, right? So this is just your overall. And I will say though that probably in the last four years, Indeed is always the number one answer. It never used to be, it never like even made the top five, but now it's always number one. And then the other thing that's interesting is networking being so high. Over half of the people interviewed um, that are employed and likely to change said that they use family and friends and connections to find employment opportunities. And now the last group of people I'm going to talk to you about today are those that said that they were unemployed and likely to accept employment. Um, of those that we interviewed, 83 and a third percent of those that said they were unemployed, so that's 7 percent, said they're likely to accept an employment offer. Um, when looking at the model, and that if you remember that footprint of, of your labor shed area, <clears throat> those that are likely to accept an offer names, about just over 1,500 of them are currently unemployed. So you find it interesting that the breakout here, um, gender-wise, is almost, or just over two-thirds are female compared to 29.4% male. The age is the same as the employed likely to change, 36 is the average. 60% um, of this group have been, been unemployed for 12 months or less. 40% um, have been over a year. Um, in their previous employment, 71.4% were full-time, followed by almost 30% part-time. And then the reasons for being unemployed. A third of these individuals said health and disability issues. This is very common in the current economic climate where it seems anyway, but presumably, if you want to be employed, you're employed right so those that are still not employed tend to have greater barriers to being employed so this answer bubbles up to the top reason where if we had high unemployment rates it'd probably still be on this list but it'd likely not be number one um, the next greatest reason for being unemployed is that they're continuing or furthering their education um, then that's followed by an employer layoff or closure as causing the unemployed and then 9.1 percent such family issues are are a barrier to becoming employed. 
the education level of your unemployed is very high. Um, again, 85.7% have an education beyond high school. I think that the employed overall was something like 85.6% or right around there. So this is very unusual. Um, we usually see probably at least a five point difference between the two groups, if not more like 10 points. So um, basically now you can look at the pie chart and see that the type of education is much different. Um, you still have a large piece of the pie with a bachelor's degree your professional degree has dropped from about 20 points to about six. And then this category that I described earlier is very large. I don't ever see it that large. Um, so this could be that a lot of students, well, not a lot because we didn't have like an overwhelming proportion of 18 to 24 year olds that were interviewed, but there could be, you know, graduate students too as well that don't see that they've completed any certification or degree yet. Um, but uh, would see themselves of having some education. Yeah. The barriers to employment, but one of the questions, any involvement with the legal system? One of the potential answers is uh, that a criminal background or um, background check or something, I can't remember how it's worded, but it would be like, uh, they have an option to give that answer. It didn't make the top. Um, that were reported. Was there an also a category for potential like drug testing, things like that? that yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, there is a, a failure to pass. Um, uh, I can't remember again how it's worded there. But again, it didn't pop up. Also, it would be a self report too, right? Like you have to take that into consideration. Would you say that on the phone? Some people would. We get those answers sometimes. <coughs> I don't know if I would. I'd be like, oh, I can't get a job because. You know, I have a bad background. Maybe I would if I was really struggling and trying to, you know, get a job and, it, and that was a major barrier. But um, you just have to keep in mind that these are just interviews um, that we're reporting on from normal people. So. <clears throat> so the unemployed likely to accept employment were earning a median of $15 an hour at their previous job. To attract 66 to 75% of this group, the unemployed likely to accept, they would want to see an offer between 1674 and 1745. However, the lowest median wage that they would ever even consider is $12.43. And again, we asked the same, how far would you go for work? And this group reported they'd be willing to travel 21 miles, on average, one way, or spend about a half hour in the car. <clears throat> and as I mentioned early, fi earlier, 54.3% of this group are actively seeking employment. That's pretty high. Um, and then they also are using the internet. Same top sites, and then additionally said that they will, if they're interested in a specific company, they just go to their website and look for job posts too. And then net networking was really high for this group. Lots of times the number two resource that's used for the unemployed is the Iowa Works Office or um, newspapers even sometimes still make the top two, which, is, which can be unusual, but networking again is a resource that's um, leveraged a lot by them. <clears throat> so that's all the results I was gonna overview for you. Um, just give you a rundown on some things that you can request of us for that deeper dive kind of analysis that I'm sure is much more interesting um, when you know exactly what kind of question you're asking. One of the things that we provide, and I brought handouts that are on the table, are occupational or industry reports. So basically we take that same data set that I just gave you the results on, and then we look at just a specific group of people that are related to an industry you're interested in, or a set of occupations you're interested in. The one that I brought is for advanced manufacturing. Um, and then the first page will show you everyone we interviewed um, that has current or former skills in an advanced manufacturing uh, occupation, where their concentration is, where they're living. Um, then the second page gives you a breakout of the job titles that were reported of that group and an estimate of how many would be living in this labor shed area, their employment status, the, way, the benefits they currently had, they desire to have, the job search resources. Again, this is a good report if you're trying to look at where should I put my money towards advertising for a specific 
niche of workers, this will get more like to the nitty gritty of, oh, teachers look here, um, construction workers look here, et cetera. And then on the back page is a customized wage report. Now, the wage report on the back is not collected through our labor shed survey. What makes it unique on these reports is that, so there's another shop in my division that collects wage um, information by job title from employers across the state. It's a mandatory report um, that's required by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And so they have like entry level wage experience, their um, annual salary that they give by job title. We take that information from them and ask them to customize it to that labor shed area um, that we're looking at, like within this area, what are the wages people are earning in these job titles? So that's why it's a customized wage report. <clears throat> All right, so can I just click on the link and we'll yeah. go? All right, cool. So, oh, maybe I gotta probably click the control button. Maybe you can go out of the PowerPoint. Okay. Um, so actually, I don't use the link. I'll show you how to get it. So on our website, iowalmi.gov slash labor shed. Well, <clears throat> oh, I forgot the dot. It's hard to see. It's a lot of pressure typing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, with these reports, do you have a handful of these like on the website, or do we reach out if we want a specific? Industry? So. Right now we're in the middle of writing reports for a lot of areas in the greater Des Moines area. Uh, so we're a little behind in delivering to the Ames Chamber. The, like, we will send out a set of four, just kind of like a starter pack, right? Sure. Um, we got the advanced manufacturing, there's three more to come, but any of them, can, you can reach out to me directly, um, can be generated for anyone, for any reason, at any time. I wish I had, um, business cards to give you. I just got married and I ordered new ones, so yeah. I'm sorry, but I do have my contact information at the end of the slideshow and I'll bring that up so you can jot it down. On our website, uh, iowalmi.gov slash labor shed, if you come to this page and there are two sections that would have AIMS data. The by city drop downs, one's an interactive format, which I'm gonna show you. The other one is the executive summary, which you have a copy of. Um, this breaks, uh, gives you a, a, a lot more information than what I've given you today in the presentation, um, but it's still, in general, an overarching, your whole data set, this is what they said. So if you want something specific, I want to look at the education industry or something, please do reach out. But re on the right is kind of a chapter book sort of thing. What are you interested in looking at specifically? We have some maps on here uh, that show, if you click on the community, the pop-up will tell you exactly what we received from employers. So I clicked on Colo, 153 employees were reported to come from Colo in pain. If you click on any of these communities, you can see the raw data we received um, from your participating employers. And wages and benefits. This will get to your question about um, the cost share of the premium. So right here, 87.5% said they share their costs for premiums with the employer, followed by 7.8% 7 saying employers pay all of it, and almost 5% saying employers pay none of it. This is something, again, that would vary um, greatly based on your industry, right? If you work for the state of Iowa, um, they don't pay all of it anymore, but um, you can see that 
uh, they're gonna have a, they're gonna fall into this we share it situation. But if you looked at it by um, by the benefit, like whether it's dental or whatever, you'd, you'd be able to see this for that. This doesn't tell you a lot about how much is the sharing, right? Like, but the like what I mentioned earlier, the employer survey that we're currently conducting does get into the more nitty gritty of <clears throat> how much do you pay? Um, is it a percentage? Is it a flat rate? And then per employee of all the benefit package, what does it cost you? Um, so yeah, you can come out here and get a lot more information <coughs> about uh, your labor shed area. This is something we didn't go over, but this is the out commute map. So Ames is blank basically here in the middle because we're talking about if you live in Ames but don't work in Ames, where do you go for work? Um, and the majority of them are coming down, it wouldn't surprise you, I'm sure, to Ankeny and Des Moines for employment. Um, that's about 17.1% are leaving Ames that are employed currently for work. It comes to about almost 8,000 people. <clears throat> Another data resource on our website is this platform here. It's called a Tableau platform. You, some of you may be familiar for, with it before. It's a data visualization platform. And we put a lot of data in here for the labor shed. And it's categorized, again, by topic here at the top. You can see these tabs. Um, if you just want you know, information about what your labor shed area looks like, you can't see. Um, I didn't click on names, did I? Go down one more. <laughs> All right, so that's your map. Uh, your again, if it's interactive, so you can hover over and see how many people are reporting from each area to come into Ames. You can navigate through these tabs and look at a lot of different data points, and they're broken down a little bit uh, by different topics other than just employed unemployed. So, for instance. <clears throat> this is your overall results from the survey of those who said they're employed, their likeliness to change, they're, they're, how are they actively seeking employment and where they're looking. But you can also look at this same group um, at, by age range. Maybe. Oh, I have to pick an age range. So we'll look at 18 to 24 year olds and see how different they are. And you can uh, look at each age range group or you can look at it by um, industry and select construction and see how much it differs for that group. And each of these tabs allows you to look at things by different breakouts like that. So this is our wage tab. And let's say we wanna look at it by occupational category. So that's that information from that slide about the median hourly wage and the lowest that they're willing to accept if they're not currently in the workforce. So it's interesting sometimes that like people are employed in this occupational category are earning $20.50. Those who are not employed would only accept something that's more than what everyone else is earning. <laughs> so sometimes the results are funny. Um, but yeah, it can be uh, eye-opening sometimes when you look at different factors. Um, and and then again, like that's all available uh, in these tabs and the topics they're related to. This tab, the occupational, oops, not that one. Occupational report tab is something that is more uh, like right at my fingertips I can get now um, for AIMS. These are the occupational reports. Keep doing that. Um, that you have an example of here, but it's in a fashion you can't really print it. So, I mean, you can do a screenshot of it or something, but um, so you can change this. I'm sorry, it's so hard for you to see. Ames, um, and then it has advanced manufacturing, biotechnology, call center and customer service, financial services, food processing, warehouse and distribution. Those are your options on the site. There's still more that we can do for you if you're interested education, um, wholesale, retail trade, and I mean, as long as we have the data, we can do a report. So even if you wanted to say, I am interested in just like forklift drivers and, and long over the road truckers and some third one, right? If we have enough people in our data set that reported that job title, we can do a report for you on them. Now maybe there's only 
three guys or something. So it was like, no, we, we're not going to stand behind the results of that report. So we're not going to generate it. But <clears throat> question here. So do you pull, I, since they're independently, like, do you have any reports on maybe like Uber, Lyft, or drivers in general, personal drivers, stuff like that? We have never been asked to do a report on that. I'm not sure how many people report that as a job title. I'm, I'm sure there's some in there. I don't know if there'd be enough to do. You well, could combine them with like taxi drivers. And that's where we're, that's where I'm at. So okay. you have a spot for taxis. So. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Because I didn't know, because with Ames being as they are, you know, we just opened up here and it's one of those things where we really don't have a potential to look at. Sure. So that's what I was asking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any job title someone reports, as long as there's enough people that are reporting it, we can do it. Um, and then this last tab are the wages that are on that last page of the report that was handed out to you, except for it's not just specific to advanced manufacturing, it's every occupational wage that we have data on for AIMS. So you just select AIMS, apply, and then you can see what counties make up because on, on this report, you have to look at the county level, but we've only included county, counties where the labor shed uh, geography shows that a lot of the communities is almost that whole county, or, or it is that whole county. And then this is every occupational title that we have in wage information on for the Ames labor shed area. Um, it's organized by occupational code, which may mean nothing to you, uh, but they're all, you can just go to this drop down and type in or select the occupation you're interested in looking at and get that information as well. So. If you wanted a customized report, like where I, I want these three things, is mm -hmm. there a fee for that or? No, nope. oh. mm -hmm. nope. uh, you can ask for it through the chamber and they'll relay it to us or you can ask, ask me directly for it as well. And I oh, might as well just pull up the, this is my contact information. Um, I don't know if any of you ever received an email me from me before, but it was previously lippled and now it's green. And then this is our uh, <laughs> LMI director, Ryan Murphy. You can always reach out to him as well. <clears throat> then besides the, the labor shed stuff, I did want to take a minute to show you a few other labor market resources we have on our website. Um, So you just go to iowalmi.gov. This is our homepage. Um, uh, this is updated every month with the unemployment rate. Uh, we have a lot of wage data that's available outside of the labor shed study. Um, and all of it can na be navigated from this top ribbon here. Um, for instance, one, oops, I the uh, unemployment rate, that's the popular um, data point people are interested in. <clears throat> you can come down and see where Story County is at, any surrounding counties. Um, you can compare your area, these tabs. Always when you're on our page and you see these data visualizations, um, make sure to notice that there are probably multiple tabs of data above so you can flip through them and see other um, ways of it being displayed. Um, <clears throat> one thing you can do, is for instance, come over here and let's add MSA to this table and we'll add the Ames Metro supply. And you can see that that line was added here and you can see kind of an area comparison, how you compare to the nation, how you compare to the state. You can add other counties in here um, and it has historical data in here as well. So you can see how things have changed. On almost every of all of our pages, we always also provide an Excel or CSV file that you can, if you're a data net and you'd rather like actually look at the raw data that's feeding into this visualization and you can decipher it, we do provide that for people who are interested in doing their own analysis in a different way. Um, <clears throat> another popular one, and it's similar to the wage tab on the labor shed viz that I just showed you, but this is for, uh, called the Iowa Wage Report, 
And the only thing that's really different about it as far as the information it's showing is that it doesn't have it by the labor shed ge geographies. It has it by statewide or your local workforce development area. Um, but it gives you wage data by occupation. Obviously, you can see this one, the default is accountants. And it's showing you like what's the difference between a, a um, <clears throat> median wage and experienced wage. Um, and gives you some information about the employment level. And it's also displayed in different ways as well depending on how you like to digest it, and is available for download. So like in the accounting space, does the data get more granular as far as like, I mean, accounting's got a number of different job titles. So I mean, an AP specialist versus a controller might look different. Is that, is so the wage that you're, that you're representing yeah. at $24 or 24,000, sure. whatever it is, sure. is that? So, um, yeah, there are, there are um, for certain, occupation types there are breakouts there I know we do have controller in there there's like chief financial officer in there um, they're like for um, health care there's registered nurses and also registered nurse anesthetists and also you know so there are it's not just like you either fall in this category or not again it also depends on the participation of the employer and how much data we have to make the estimates public because if there's not enough data we suppress it to protect you know, they, you know, if there's a certain area that has one hospital and one nurse anesthetist and you report that wage, it's pretty easy to figure out, oh, that's what Becky's making, right? So um, if it's low like that, it gets suppressed. But as long as there's enough participation and enough participation in those job titles, then they'll be represented. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you guys' data needs that you have that I'd like to know fill in the blank that maybe I can show you where to find it today or I can take a note about it to get back to you in the future. All right, well, I am always available at that email address and phone number, so please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about Labor Shed or LMI, labor market information, period. Like, it's my job to kind of track that down. I know where it's at. Instead of you guys banging your heads against a wall, Call me and I'll bang my head against the wall. <laughs> okay?